We're going to talk today about introducing technology to traditional peace building programs. Um, so before Build Peace, I wrote a blog post framing some of the issues we'll be talking about. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I know that all of you read it several times and retweeted it extensively. But um, I'll just go over some of the few key points as an introduction to um, our panelists. So if I ask what we talk about when we talk about peace building, I could probably get a different set of answers from each different person in this room. But in general, um, when we think of peace building, we've evolved from you know, the Galtian concept of negative peace towards a concept of positive peace where we're talking not just about resolving conflict and addressing the causes of conflict, but a whole panoply of activities to bring conflicting parties together to find a common interest, you know, eventually rebuilding social ties, um, supporting institutions that are responsive to citizen needs, equitable development, participatory decision making. And when we talk about technology, I mean, we've heard about all these brilliant ideas um, that are being used currently uh, from the different presenters today. Um, there's very high tech stuff, big data, satellites, drones. But in many of these peace building contexts, what we're really looking at is quite basic technology, you know? Transistor radios, those old school, unbreakable Nokia mobile phones. Um, um, but one thing that's common is that no matter the level of technology you're talking about, it's increasingly ubiquitous. So more and more people are having access to these tools. So for example, um, when I joined Facebook, it was this cool exclusive club for people from certain universities only. And now my 12 year old cousins can post YouTube videos of cats playing the piano on my wall. So, you know, I think we can all agree we've reached the peak of human civilization here with uh, all these developments. But, um, so technology is increasingly everywhere you look, and as well, uh, we in the NGO sector, we're hearing from donors and funders this buzzword, innovation, you know, bring us something that's game-changing, bring us something that's new, bring us something fresh. And this is how we end up with projects, you know, giving iPads to newborn babies in rural villages in Burkina Faso to track their health indicators. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but the point still stands. So we have this technologies everywhere, there's increasing pressure to use it. So we want to now look at, you know, what are some of the challenges and the opportunities for integrating this technology into peace building? Or maybe do we need to completely relook at the way that we frame peace building in light of these new tools? And so when we look at opportunities, these are things that have been discussed over um, the course of the day, you know, technology can help us to collect and analyze information in order to prevent, respond, and evaluate conflict. It can connect, unite, and mobilize people, funds, and influence. It can facilitate civic engagement and accountability mechanisms. It can provide a safe space for new ways of thinking, new debates, you know, is the dress black and blue or white and gold? Is the cat going up the stairs or coming down? all the most salient issues in today's world. So in some, new technologies can alter uh, relations and mutual expectations between citizens, governments, policymakers, and practitioners in the field of peace building. But there are also challenges which we've seen throughout today, um, especially with the fact that a lot of the time these tools are not specifically designed for peace building, but simply adapted which would call us to question some of the assumptions that we have about technology's capacity to empower, to connect, to democratize. And some of the challenges that we might talk about um, as a panel and with, with the crowd as well around issues of local legitimacy and value, uh, vertical transfer of information instead of horizontal sharing of information, assumptions about whether access to knowledge actually leads to change in behavior and attitudes, um, whether we're reinforcing power asymmetries and, you know, the, like all these issues about security threats. So our panelists today are Dr. Yanis Kalidis, who is a professor um, at the College of International Studies, Kyungi University in South Korea. He came a very long way for this panel, I understand, about three days of travel, so he's excused for any incoherent rambling. The rest of us have no excuse. 
<laughs> and he will be looking at the opportunities and challenges for integrating ICTs in peace building context. Um, Aaron Schneier, who you'll remember from last night, was our great musician um, and entertainer. He's the founder and CEO of Heartbeat FM, which is a nonprofit organization that looks at how music can be used to unite Palestinian and Israeli youth. And then we'll have Andrew Dunbrack, who is a member of UNICEF's Global Peacebuilding Education and Advocacy Program Management Team. For full disclosure, my organization, Search for Common Ground, works together with uh, Andrew's program. So if it seems like I'm giving him all the easy questions, it's just a coincidence. Hashtag please keep funding us. <laughs> and uh, he's going to be talking about UNICEF's experiences in Burundi and Uganda as a means of developing evidence-based programming. So thank you, and I will hand the floor over to our distinguished panelists. Oh no, this is working. All right, excellent. Uh, a big thank you to the organizers for organizing what has proved by the end of today to be a very exciting uh, uh, conference with all these ideas and all this info and insights. Um, uh, my talk is based on a, on a paper that I wrote with uh, my colleague from uh, Liverpool Hope University, uh, Dr. Stephanie Kapler. Uh, and it was uh, essentially the title is uh, risks, opportunities, and challenges for ICTs in peace building. Uh, we've had a lot of the risks and the opportunities today. Um, so I would like to focus rather than reiterate or regurgitate most of what we have today. Um, I would like to focus on some challenges. We've heard with many uh, panels and many presentations how you have a dual character for ICTs in peace building. You have the good and you have the bad, and I'm really happy that a lot of you in your talks and in your intervention, you said it's both. It can be both good, it can be both bad. Um, this is reflected in how me and my co-author have conceptualized ICTs. So you have this empowerment uh, notion for ICTs, that ICTs can empower local populations, they can uh, empower the everyday, uh, change status quo, uh, challenge uh, status quo and politics and how it happens. On the other hand, you have the hegemony aspect, which is empowering essentially the uh, authoritarian regimes. It's uh, what we have ra uh, rather than a liberator to ICTs, ICTs can uh, effectively become a very oppressive, very repressive uh, tool. Me and my co-author, we have also identified a third dimension, which is the one of uh, uh, neutrality or neglect. And this is down to structural factors, which uh, I, I think I'll be talking a lot about structures, but one of them is where you don't have, for instance, ICTs, either because there is an ICT literacy or a more fundamental problem where there is no electricity. Uh, and in these cases, in, in post-conflict peace building settings where you have these kind of structural problems, you, you have international organizations or even NGOs, international NGOs, neglecting the use of ICTs. And that means that you are ignoring uh, or even sidelining the potential that you could have by empowering the locals or empowering the, uh, the, the grassroots. Now, and this is actually a conversation I had with Jordi uh, uh, about an hour ago, and I think I had been a very, uh, on the attack about him, surprising him, saying, well, why are you trying to catch up rather than being the pioneers as the UN in trying to foment use of uh, uh, ICTs, of technological tools for, for peace building. Um, this is a third dimension in what we've heard today. Now, from that point on, I want to use the rest of the time in asking some fundamental questions. We've, we've had the most fundamental question that I've, I've heard today is, what do we mean by peace? And I think this is a very difficult question that we are not going to be able to answer uh, anywhere near uh, in the future. There, there's different con uh, conceptions, there's different uh, visualizations of peace uh, by different actors. But one thing we can uh, agree on is that peace, as well as peace building, is a political act. I should mention at this point that just like Phil from the previous uh, panel, my background is on peace building uh, studies and terrorism studies. So I'm not really a, a technology geek or a te technologist uh, even. 
uh, and I very much, I, I'm very much happy that he used this notion of tool, that ICTs can serve as tool. I'm looking at it from the point of peace building. Uh, now, unlike Phil, I have my own iPad here that doesn't work, but if there's a power cut, I'm, it's still going to be on. Uh, so, sorry for that, uh, if it hurts your eyes. Um, so, from that point of view, from a peace and conflict studies point of view, peace building is a political act. So, in that sense, if you combine it with the ontology of ICTs as tool, ICTs becomes a political tool. So, in some uh, sense, uh, ICTs can change, so they do have a positive political uh, uh, dealing uh, with peace building. They can change the status quo, they can change the power plays as we want to change them, but sometimes they reinforce it, again, something that we heard. But what I want to point out is that politics, and this goes back to a comment that I have about critical thinking, um, politics is both about change as well as about resisting change, and the resistance to change has quite a few different meanings. Resistance to change can be the IS, the Islamic State. Uh, but the resistance to change can also be those local populations or what we identify in the literature or in the lingo as everyday populations who resist the change, the very changes introduced by the World Bank or introduced by UNDP or introduced by all these international organizations. In uh, the literature, for those of you not familiar with uh, uh, liberal peace building, what we call liberal peace building is again some kind of an imposition. These are our terms as an international community of peace, of peace builders and donors and organizations. These are our terms. Uh, this is how we expect you to accept the peace that we bring with us or there will be no funding or there will be no change or there will be no support for local initiatives or needs or whatever needs and demands you might have. So that resistance is also part of politics as politics is played out. Uh, uh, played out in uh, peace building. And again, it strikes, it goes back to a comment, uh, a question slash comment that was brought up in the previous uh, panel that we are trying to do something, we are trying to utilize ICTs for good because we believe in the goodness of ICTs. But then when, after a month, we, we saw who is using it, we didn't expect to see that the ones we expected to use that and make good were actually not present. It was obviously uh, used by all these other sectors, by all these other segments that we didn't expect or we didn't even want them to utilize it. Um, so this is as part of, I'm, I'm identifying, I'm looking at structures and how they play with us or I, I, I'm, I've been identifying throughout the course of this day structures that we either don't recognize that we build or we don't even recognize that we are part of and therefore whatever talk we make of change is limited by these structures. For instance, we've been talking about the grassroots or again another question that has featured a couple of times throughout the day, the people. Uh, how can we uh, empower the people? Um, I think we shouldn't be uh, focusing on, on, on the tree and missing the woods as it were. Uh, who are grassroots. Uh, in, in, a, in a conversation about a year and a half ago with Sanjana, this was a point that he brought forward. It was quite an enlightening point, enlightening point. You can't be treating the grassroots as the exact same thing, not just in every case that you have, but also in the, the very one case study that you might be dealing with, either as a researcher or as an activist or, or as a, a donor organization. It's the same with who are the people, who are the people we want to empower? Are we talking, uh, are we saying, for instance, that uh, uh, the people from IS are not somehow the, the people of that particular region with these particular fundamental ideas? And so on. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to sound provocative. I have, uh, uh, there are many of examples like that from terrorism uh, studies, and especially when it comes to peace building, to bring it into the fore and bring it into link with uh, ICTs in that matter. For instance, there is this thing called prescription, which prescription is you have terrorist lists by several states and several organizations. If you are featuring in this list, then chances are you might, well, at best, you will be called for questioning. At worst, you will find yourself imprisoned. Now, there are a lot of third party mediators and a lot of negotiators that uh, essentially found themselves on these lists, people who try to break uh, talks between uh, terrorist organizations and governments or regional governments even and because of their links uh, with these bad people they found themselves 
uh, at risk of being imprisoned uh, by several governments. There is one case study that even Swiss diplomats uh, actually had to go through that same and they had to seize whatever effort for peace building with terrorist groups, with armed groups uh, in general. Now, to bring that into link with ICTs, we've been talking about empowerment and people and uh, building peace and so on. I want to just push that thing and ask, what if Facebook, what if Twitter takes up proscription? What if these media decide for us, like you and me, who is that person who is dealing with terrorism for what purpose? And therefore, they shouldn't be doing that. How are we building peace if we are not even talking to armed groups of whatever ideology, whatever uh, uh, origin? Um, so it's not just a question of who owns the data and Facebook is uh, relatively evil because they are not giving us our data. We can't own the very data that we are uh, uh, producing. But it's essentially a little bit more than that. Other structures, other words, keywords that have been flying throughout the, uh, throughout the day and I'm not relatively e uh, at ease with is another one was, for instance, uh, uh, legitimacy. Uh, again, legitimacy is not something static. Once you gain legitimacy, it doesn't mean it stays with you forever. You have to bear in mind that this is going to be changing and it depends on your actions, it depends on the audience and it depends on the audience's politics, how this is going to play out. The biggest structure in our uh, job or in our research when it comes to peace building, sovereignty. How do you deal with sovereignty effectively? And this has a lot to, uh, to do obviously with how uh, ICTs can empower autocratic regimes or uh, authoritarian regimes and, uh, and so on. Um, another final thing, and I'm going to leave it there, is there is this thing in, in peace building research called uh, research fatigue. And again, it links with that liberal peace building that I was talking about. For instance, in Bosnia, if you, as a researcher, if you show up and you say, well, I'm doing this research for peace in Bosnia, a lot of people will just go, okay, you know how many of you have been there? We're tired of you. Because you come in here for a week, you stay in your nice hotel, you go in your balcony with your laptops, you write whatever you write, and then you go. Whereas we have to live with this problem even after you go. Perhaps something like this could happen with us, trying to go somewhere and impose ICTs. In other words, could there be an imposition uh, of ICTs in peace building, just like there is an imposition of peace? So all in all, I want to close down with saying, perhaps it's not, this is how I started the day, and this was my, what my expectation was coming to this conference. We, would, we were going to focus on how to better use ICTs to better build peace. But at the end of the day, and after so, much, so many insights and so many conversations, I, I was left thinking, and this is touching again upon one of Sanjana's points, maybe it's not better ICTs that we should be building. Maybe, maybe we should be focusing on better peace building, which will then allow us to use better ICTs. And again, pushing it one step further, perhaps we should be talking about better politics, not just peace building or not just ICTs. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Aaron Schneer and I have uh, the privilege really of representing the heartbeat community of Israeli, Palestinian, international musicians, educators, activists who are coming together to, to embrace, to harness music's power to transform conflict in Israel and Palestine. At least from my perspective, the segregation between Israelis and Palestinians is really what's fueling the violence, the, the injustices, which are maintaining this conflict and, and, and harming so many people's lives. Um, for many years, I guess part of the, it's very interesting to me to be on a panel about traditional peace building, because I see our work using the arts as very, um, in a way, new, and I think in general, the, the work of people-to-people -people diplomacy is still very, underutilized and is in a very early stage of where it needs to be. Um, we do know that you know, after 50 or 60 years of research that, that uh, this idea of contact theory is, is incredibly capable of, of building trust, and transforming attitudes and behaviors um, between um, opposing groups. Um, and particularly research from Israel and Palestine 
has given us some insight into how to do this in a meaningful way. And there are three basic um, pieces of learning that, that I've used to, to form the work we do in Heartbeat. First of all is to unite people around a common purpose. And that same purpose could be, can be interpreted in different ways for different participants. But of course in our, in our work, this is music. Um, secondly is to make sure that these spaces are, are creating spaces of equality. Even though outside of these spaces often, and especially where I'm coming from, um, that equality does not exist in society. And thirdly, is to make sure that these experiences are sustained. And we know from, from evaluations of, of work in Israel and Palestine that if we have an encounter program, immediately afterwards there can be a tremendous transformation in attitudes and behaviors. But six months later, that if there's no follow-up, that, that impact can be cut in half, and a year later, we know that it can disappear entirely. And of course, it's, it's very difficult for, for these seeds to grow when the ground is toxic. And the, the best estimate that I can come to is that less than 1% of Israelis and Palestinians have had a meaningful, sustained, trust-building encounter, respect-building encounter. And for me, this is, this is what's essentially fueling the continuation of this conflict. So in Heartbeat, we're utilizing music as a tool really to amplify voices that are not heard in the communities. And in addition to bringing together youth musicians um, for face-to-face for -face encounters, our hope is that music itself, the song that they create, can travel far beyond the studios where the song was created and can actually impact millions of people towards reaching a critical mass. Um, essentially, the way our program works, like today we have 40 youth musicians active in the programs in four different bands. They're meeting each week in their home cities. And guided by musician facilitators, they, they engage in a year-long or often multi-year process of dialogue about the realities they face to raise critical consciousness, um, coupled with music education, music creation, learning about songwriting, learning about improvisation, and taking the content that comes out of their dialogue process and weaving that into their songs. And once ready, they go into their communities performing, giving concerts, giving workshops, and using uh, all the tools we have available of digital media production and, and publication to, to share their music as widely as possible. Their music videos through audio releases and whatnot. And so what we know so far is that our youth are having a, a tremendously powerful transform, transformation experience where they're, they are changing their attitudes towards the other side. They are deepening their, their awareness and their ability to, to navigate their world and their future. They are they're shifting their attitudes and, and their behaviors where because they have this, this knowledge, because they know that they have partners, they, they experience a sense of agency and a sense of responsibility to do more. The question remains, what kind of impact can we have if we're if on our audiences? If someone comes to see a concert for two hours or if someone watches a music video for five minutes, what impact can really be had? So one of our hopes, and what we're trying to do in, in the best ways we can, is to use the tools of, of analytics and to, to find other tools to understand um, how our audiences are engaging um, and trying to find other ways for them to collaborate where maybe seeing a music video can spin off into taking pieces of that video and, and adding their own song, you know, their own instruments to it and, creating more opportunities for interactivity. And I think one of the, one of the very exciting things that I've learned about is, is this idea of parasocial contact, where we see some cases around the world. One that comes to mind is in, in Rwanda, where, where members of uh, the Hutu and Tutsi groups were able, who, who didn't actually have a chance to sit and have this this intergroup, positive intergroup experience themselves were actually exposed to a radio 
per, uh, radio broadcast, which allowed them to witness these positive intergroup relations, um, which we can see actually transformed attitudes and behaviors without actually having these two communities, these two participant groups sit, sit face to face. So I believe there's a huge potential here. And as we're moving forward, um, one of the, the very exciting things is the potential to use the internet to also create spaces for, for musical cooperation beyond or between borders, across borders that otherwise wouldn't be able to be crossed. So there's some amazing tools. Um, one which we're piloting now with an organization called whojam.com, which allows us to create music videos um, across the internet, adding video clips, adding instruments, in, in you know, really beyond, beyond borders. Um, a few others like jammer.net or ejamming.net.com have, have paved some of the way for us to, to jam over the internet in real time. Um, of course, there's a lot of work to do to, to make, these, make these experiences as meaningful as, as a face-to-face -face encounter. And one of the things we're hoping to do is, is to really to bring our understanding of how to facilitate these experiences in a meaningful way to participants who, who are willing to engage in a long-term meaningful um, encounter through the internet. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, thanks to our organizers. Uh, I'm Drew. I'll be representing uh, UNICEF and our partners out there. Afterwards, if you have any questions, I might direct them to our people most relevant to answer those questions. Um, I'd like to basically tell you a little bit of background about our program, the Peace Building Education and Advocacy Program. Um, and then maybe say a few words about why it's not necessarily the traditional peace building program, and then talk about how we're using technology um, in our program. Uh, so back in 2012, we launched Peace Building Education and Advocacy Program. Uh, we're supported by the government of Netherlands. Uh, it was a four-year program. This year is, is the last year. We're in um, Burundi, Uganda, South Sudan, Somalia, DRC, Cote d'Ivoire, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Chad, Yemen, Pakistan, Palestine, and Myanmar. So uh, very global in nature, it's a big program. Uh, we have five outcome levels. Uh, it's an integrated approach, so we work at the policy level. Uh, really this means we're trying to infuse uh, peace building priority plans or peace building policies with education. An example of this, uh, in Liberia, we were able to get transformative education on their national roadmap for reconciliation. We also work uh, with education sector plans, trying to ensure complex sense of education uh, delivery. We work at the institutional level, and here we're trying to enhance the capacity of institutions to deliver social services, uh, primarily in education, uh, to deliver education for peace building. Uh, we work at the community and individual level, and at this level we're really focused on conflict prevention, conflict management, uh, and increasing social cohesion, um, building peace, building competencies at that level. Uh, we also have a, an outcome that's entirely focused on education, a more formal education sector, uh, with a focus on equity, um, how we can improve access to quality education for children affected by conflict, uh, how we can create, use schools as create, um, create schools for uh, safe spaces, um, improve teacher training, improve curriculum, more your core education work. And then finally, the fifth outcome, which is on research, we really want to improve the, the evidence base for why education can contribute to peace building. Um, under the UN peace building architecture and other global frameworks for peace building, there's a huge focus on uh, rule law, security sector reform, and political settlements that lead to, to elections. Uh, this is very important. However, it's not necessarily enough or sufficient for building sustainable peace. peace. Uh, most of our research has, has shown that really what's at the heart of, of conflict-affected communities and, and citizens, what they really care the most about and what they're concerned with is access to social services. So again, uh, 
there's a lot of discussion about corruption, for example, but if you press people, why do you care that governments are corrupt? Why do you care? They'll, they'll start saying, they'll think about it more, and they're like, well, I can't get access to health care, or I cannot educate my kids, or I can't send them to school. So it's really, you know, what, what's the point of governments? It's really one of the key points, you know, security, but also delivery of social services. Um, so what our program is trying to sort of demonstrate and prove, and this is how it's maybe not necessarily traditional, is, uh, you know, education isn't just a peace dividend. Social uh, services aren't just peace dividends, but they can actually contribute to peace building. Um, so that's kind of the background uh, of the program itself. Um, now, our vision, or the, the impact level results for, for our program are articulated as strengthened resilience, social cohesion, and human security in conflict affected context. Okay, so we have this challenge. How do we measure amorphous concepts like resilience, or social cohesion, uh, or human security, which really kind of is a, a, a lot of things. I mean, it's, it's everything. There's a lot under human security. It's uh, a basket of, of different issues. Um, so our original uh, program design, we had sort of output level um, things that we were going to measure, which was really activity based. You know, how many children did we did were uh, had access to, to education for peace building? How many countries changed their policies to um, deliver complex sense of education? How many duty bearers did we train to manage conflict? Things like this, but they didn't really get to that, that impact level of did we actually strengthen social cohesion, resilience, and human security. So in order to tackle this challenge, uh, UNICEF partnered with Harvard Humanitarian Initiatives. Uh, we have a pilot that was just recently completed in Burundi and Uganda. Um, the partnership had two key object objectives. One was in the participatory manner, trying to figure out how to measure the changes we were trying to achieve. And then the second was how can we use technology to build an effective and simple way to collect that information, take those measurements, and then, and, and then repeat that over time. Uh, Harvard uh, has a, they developed a, a technology a toolbox, it's called Kobo. I don't know, maybe some of you are familiar with it basically allows you to build uh, knowledge, attitude, perception surveys, uh, load those onto smartphones or tablets, and then go out in the community and do a population-based survey on you know, knowledge, attitude, perceptions around these more complex uh, concepts like resilience and, and social cohesion. Uh, the best part about this software and what we did is that you could actually visualize the results. So, once the data came back, uh, we, we, there's a geomapping tool where we can actually look and see uh, in which geographic areas. And one of the innovations that they've, they've sort of done with, with our partnership is they've, they've been able to disaggregate by sort of age. So we have uh, adults and youth, and then we have um, male and female. So we can disaggregate and then look by region where we have the most, you know, where, where the most challenges are, where, where the, those hotspots are, where we need to sort of focus our attention. So it's, it's evidence-informed programming. We can sort of change what we're doing and our priorities based on being able to visualize where, where the priority areas are. Um, now, so we, we've just completed these baselines. We have the, the, the maps. Uh, one thing I have to say about this data is there's a lot of information. There's so much information there. Um, it's really going to take us some time to figure out how to analyze that data and how, you know, what it means, like what actions we need to take to sort of reprioritize or reshape um, what we're doing. But then also, also it's really important that we sort of run uh, periodic sort of scans um, and take the pulse of, of those areas in order to sort of check back in to see if our programs are doing better and to compare them with other non-intervention sites. So this is all basically about the design and monitoring and evaluation of our programming. Um, and it's, it's brand new. Uh, and it's also, you know, it's a, we have a long time frame, which generally peace building programs, you know, a, a year or so. This, year, this is a four year program. Um, so we're, we have a better start. In Burundi, uh, UNICEF made a conscious effort because Burundi was part of the New Deal um, peace building and state building goals. We made a conscious effort to really do a sort of baseline that can feed into the assessment of fragility for Burundi in terms of measuring 
uh, peace building, state building goals, do a baseline for that, but then also try and interrogate what we mean by social cohesion and resilience and, and baseline for that. Um, and then uh, also in Burundi, they'll, they'll be doing follow-ups with Search for Common Ground and partners uh, to, to find out more. You know, when you get sort of the big data and the, the quantitative and the percentages, there's a lot of interesting things in there that you want to be able to tease out. So we'll, we'll be following up with focus groups um, and do more qualitative investigation in terms of that doesn't make sense. What, what is it saying to us? So um, that's also an important aspect. <coughs> Uganda was a really interesting case because it also, you know, we have our innovations lab there in Uganda. So um, there's a lot of interesting things going on in technology in Uganda, and we're trying to try and figure out how to um, how the the work that we're doing with Harvard can interact with those other innovations. Um, it's also uh, Uganda is relatively stable uh, compared to a place like Burundi or, or Yemen. Uh, you know, so what does grievances mean? What, what are people's priorities in that situation? So you can really sort of unpack more those underlying causes of conflict and see how you can prioritize your programming. And again, look at where, where the, the hotspots are. Um, we actually have at the tech fair, I don't know if we, uh, today we had the, uh, the, the results up. And if you're interested in seeing these results, they're. Uh, I think they're at peacebuildingdata.org, but if you are curious about sort of the survey and what it looks like, we have that here. So just get a hold of me. Um, so in Uganda, there's a handful of, of really interesting, innovative platforms that we have there. The first one is DevTrack. Okay, wow. Um, DevTrack is a Basically, it's, it's a geomapping tool that allows you to see where people are, donors are funding projects, find out about that project, and know what its, its funding source is. So in terms of like government transparency on where development money is going and what we're doing with it, it's very good in terms of countering that, that conflict factor of, we don't trust our government, you're not transparent. You report, Monica uh, alluded to it. You report, basically, you, uh, short, you send a short code to, uh, through yourself, you become a U reporter. There's 300,000 of them. U report is a very powerful tool. Uh, as Monica mentioned, there's a lot to do with sort of hearing the voice of, of young people. Um, they'll do uh, question strings that say, uh, you know, nobody's nobody's applying for this fund that the government <coughs> set up for uh, um, for accessing you know uh, startup money for for entrepreneurial activities. Did you know about that? Okay, now you do, why aren't you applying? It's because they're requiring a secondary level certificate, so then you get that information, you go to the government, you say, can you please change this? They said yes, so then that, you know, resolve that problem, and now young people feel like, you know, it's, the, the government is responsive to their needs. So this is just an example. The other thing that your report did is you could just send stuff to your report. So we have partners, Mary Stokes in the health sector, that run a call sector, or a call center, and things will come in like my grandma has malaria. I don't know what to do. And when you sign up for uh, when you sign up for your report, it'll tell you the gender, where you're located, and you can see that in the call center. So you can say, okay, uh, I can see you're from this area. Did you know there's a free clinic, you know, seven kilometers down the road? Take your grandmother there. So it's basically a, a powerful tool for connecting people to social services. Um, a lot of other examples there too, but uh, I guess the point is, is it's, a, it's a tool. We haven't quite figured out how to maximize the usage of that tool. Um, we also have EduTrack. Uh, there was a colleague earlier from Search that was talking about you know tracking uh, um, in education in the health sector. How do we track the services? You know, did the books come? Were the teachers there? Um, what's the state of your school? You know, so we can track these these various things, and then the government is saying, hey, we have this this tool. Uh, through ICT where we can sort of track and be more responsive to the services so that they're equitable in quality that we're delivering. Um, we also have a digital school in the box that's out there, so uh, feel free to check that out if you haven't already. Uh, I'll try and wrap this up. Uh, we, uh, I think we have some powerful tools in terms of, like I said, in terms of establishing baselines and this geomapping tool and, we, and, and stuff like you report where they're, they're there, but we're still trying to work through how, how we can program better uh, and, and how we can use them better. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities there. So thank you.
Okay, thank you to our uh, panelists. I'm just going to go over some of the issues that were raised, some of the contentious questions as kind of like a framing before we invite the audience to ask questions. Um, you know, in, in Yanis's talk, I found it very interesting that you talked about how we in peace building are kind of behind the curve when it comes to technology. We're having this conference and talking about things which to me are so advanced that it seems almost like magic, but at the same time, you know, we're talking about SMS technology. Meanwhile, there are institutions out there that are one step away from literally hacking into our thoughts. So we are kind of behind the curve, but at the same time, there's an interesting debate to be had about, you know, our responsibility to be cautious and to take our time because, you know, we have to respect these principles of do no harm. And we've talked about all the issues around unintended consequences. So there is this balance to be struck between looking for the best tools to achieve our aims of peace building most efficiently and also our responsibility, you know, to, to at the very worst, you know, do no harm in the context that we're intervening in. There's also the issue which I thought was very interesting about peace building as being um, a political act. And maybe one of the big challenges that we've seen in peace building programs is that people are reluctant to accept that. A lot of peace builders tend to think of themselves as neutral, and that's one of the reasons we embrace technology, because we see technology is neutral, we're neutral, hooray, it goes together. But that's often not the case, and one of the issues is that we take technology as far as it can go neutrally. So we say we'll provide the platforms for people to have access to information, but then we don't take the next step, which is to support people to be able to analyze and mobilize around that action, because that is a very political act. And that is outright stating that, you know, maybe you're taking sides, but you're doing something concrete. So a lot of the challenges lie in, we use technology to go so far, and then we get a bit scared of the political consequences and back off. Um, uh, in terms of um, uh, Aaron's uh, speech, I really liked um, this aspect, this idea of social contact, contact theory. Um, I don't know how many of you were there yesterday at the SCORE um, presentation, but one really interesting finding, I think it was that between maybe Serbs and Croats or Bosniaks and, Croats, uh, Bosniaks and Serbs was that the more social contact they had, the more cultural distance they actually felt because the kinds of social contacts they had were not positive. And so it was really interesting that you talked about how you were preparing these people for that social contact. So it's not just a question of taking people and putting them in a group together and kind of seeing what happens, but it's also about all the prep work that goes into it of ensuring that they're in the right frame of mind but then that also has to be balanced against the need to not um, use a self-selecting group. So if you're taking people that are already willing to be in contact with the others, then you're not really reaching the people that most need to be reached. Um, and what was also really interesting is that in your project, you have not just these youth creating something together, but you're giving them an external outlet for expression. So they also have the chance to take what they've created and share it with an external audience. And I think that's a really important aspect. And it also raises interesting questions about how do you make sure that something that's produced for one target group can also resonate with the other groups with which it's shared. Um, in terms of um, Andrew's presentation, so a lot of what I was hearing from you was about access to platforms for change. Whether that change turns out to be positive or negative is something that can be measured in the long term. But all of these initiatives are about technology being used to facilitate people's access to platforms, whether those platforms are about dialogue or services or access to information and stakeholders. And what was really interesting I found also is technology's capacity to help us measure change in the long term over a period of many years because uh, a lot of evaluations measure immediate results. So, you know, if Yanis is hungry, I give him a sandwich, and then after that I say, Yanis, how is the sandwich? And he has no choice but to say it was delicious. But if I come back maybe four or five years and say, how did you really feel about that sandwich? He might not even remember what I'm talking about. So I think it's really important, this idea that we can apply technology to measure change over a longer period of time 
and measure the sustainability of what it is we're trying to do. And so with that, I will open the floor up to the audience for questions. Yes. In front. Hello. Hello, I'm Robin. I'm a graduate student in Conflict and Peace Studies from Nepal. Uh, first of all, deep prayers uh, for all the victims in earthquake in Nepal. My prayers to them. So my questions are uh, mostly related with music and peace. And I guess uh, as tools of peace building, technology, music. Uh, so I think my questions will, will be relevant to uh, the, the whole panel itself. So my questions, uh, my questions are mostly related with uh, liminal influence of powerful tools of peace source as music and technology, and also about local ownership and sustainability of such projects that use these tools. Uh, so for a few months, I was engaged in a research in a music education program in Nepal, which used music as a tool of peace building, bringing conflict affected children from different backgrounds in a music school. So one of my findings overlaps uh, with the findings of Aaron, I guess, when he discuss about uh, the use of music as a tool of peace building. So what I found was that the children who were from lower caste or who were from marginalized uh, backgrounds, when I talked to them, what they shared was in music school, they, found, they find a very equal, uh, equal environment. Like they enjoy with their friends from different backgrounds. But when, the, when they go back to the home, when they go back to their villages, they are back in their own world again. So what, what I'm concerned about, and what I, think, what I guess to be one of the main point of discussion is the lineal influence of these tools of uh, peace building. So how can we, so I think the main challenge lies in how can we make, how can we take the influence beyond the liminal space, such as music classroom or concert spaces, to the real life, to the real place, where people are affected by, this, by inequalities, by conflict, by discrimination. So second question is regarding lo local ownership and sustain uh, sustainability. The music education program that I studied was uh, implemented and supported by a non-profit, a US-based non-profit. So what the US pro non-based profit was ultimately willing to do was hand over the music program to the local community. So not only the music program, but any peace building project that uses tools such as technology, music, arts. So when they are like, ultimately this should be handed over to local community for sustainability. But what local people faces uh, in, uh, in implementing these projects themselves is lack of knowledge. So beside the tools, I think one of the important factors uh, that we should uh, be concerned about is handing over the knowledge as well as resources to them. To them. So thank you. So thank you, Praveen, for the great questions. Um, and my prayers also for the people of Nepal. Um, I think these are really important questions. Um, without question, um, this issue of what happens when, when the participants return home to the inequalities in society is, is a very big one. Um, and for me, the first thing is to ensure that these programs are sustained. Um, that the relationships that they form are sustained, and that these, these experiences of, e of equality are sustained. So that the relationships that they have with others continue, that, that these pockets, that these bubbles of equality can, can stay strong, and they, they eventually can grow with more opportunities like this. And I think as a, as a community, the better we make the case for these programs, the more programs we can fund, and the more opportunities there will be, so that so that uh, those students at the music school you talked about will not be the only ones in their community who have that experience. Um, it's a long road. <laughs> um, and in terms of local ownership and, and the challenge of, of the lack of knowledge to, to maintain and, and continue these programs, um, certainly this is a huge, huge issue. <coughs> Um, in, in my work, what we're now trying to do is to, is to um, take our model and train new facilitators to do this. It's, 
it's complicated work to, to facilitate meaningful experiences for young people, especially when we're faced with conflict and inequalities. And um, just as teachers need training and doctors need training, I think I think these facilitators need training. Um, and I think I think there's there's plenty of ways to make that happen. Um, so I'll be happy to talk to you more after. I'm Marianne uh, from the Peace Superheroes uh, Digital Gate. And this is as much a question for the panel as it is for the organizers. Um, I've been wrestling with kind of the fundamental problem of technology and peace. Because after all, technology does require resources. I live in Mozambique, where it's a country that's literally being mined for its resources. Um, coal, a lot of coal is being shipped off to China to power Chinese consumption of technology. Uh, I don't need to go into what's happening in DR Congo, how wars are being fueled in DR Congo, so that we can all have the components that go into our technology. And so I'm wondering, how can we talk about do no harm when we're using technology, which is actually fomenting wars, conflict, famine, um, and, and not creating peace? I don't know if in, in Mozambique there's certainly a problem with access to electricity because certain people are using lots of technology, which is uh, necessitating a lot of, tech, of uh, electricity, and then other people are not having access to it, creating frustration, creating disenfranchisement, and my prediction, creating potential violence in the country in the next five years. Uh, I don't know if there's something similar going on in Israel and Palestine with access to electricity, um, so, so this is something that I'm really wrestling with, um, kind of de deontologically, ontologically, um, at this conference. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll start with uh, Yanis. Yeah, I think it's a very good point. Uh, that the tech we use for peace is a conflict-generated tech. Um, ontologically, yes, it is very interesting, but. I, it's part of, or it could be very well part of what I was the point I was trying to make during the, my, my my ten minutes, in the sense that we are moving inside structures that even uh, we either haven't identified, and this is one of these. We we just, or it's one of the newest ones that we only just discovered, and we want to rectify. You see all these new mobiles, for instance, that are not built for a, a one year uh, a lifetime. They are built for more than that. You can just change the components. So a lot of people are saying that this is gonna have an effect. And to a certain extent, it has been based on the effects that technology has had on the TRC and other Sub-Saharan Africa that we have overmined. Chinese technological companies now have overmined and so on. So again, it's something, yes, there is some change, but we came really late to realize it. Um, in terms of how can we get rid of that burden, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not a technologist, so I cannot give you any insights into that. But uh, from, a, uh, from a theoretician's point of view, from an academic point of view, again, it's, it's the more and the faster and the sooner we identify these kind of structures that have an actual, very tangible effect on people's lives, people whose lives we're trying to save, we're trying to uh, do better, then that's when we are perhaps doing a better job. But unfortunately, I'm, I, I don't have an answer as to if anybody else does, I, I'm as happy as you to listen to it. Uh, uh, would any of our panelists uh, like to respond as well to the question? Uh, I would just add, I mean, I'm not a panelist, but when we look at much of the social change that has happened historically, it tends to come either from killing all your opponents or co-opting the people who are seen as the bad guys as such. And I think as peace builders, we can't really espouse the killing all your opponents approach. And so the option that's left to us is to try and change the system from within and recognize, we, you know, the first step is, as you said, recognizing that the harm that this does and you know how this is counterproductive to our 
eventual goals at the same time, completely getting rid of these tools would also be counterproductive. So it is incumbent on us as peace builders and as critical thinkers to try and change those structures from within and try and think about new ways of thinking about this and not just ignore it as a, oh, yeah, there's a conflict mineral in my phone, but I'm not going to think about it right now. Yes. Thank you very much. I have learned a lot today. I'm Marta Llanos from Peru, and mainly working on the field of arts and peace building. I just heard only one uh, uh, aspect's idea said that art is irreplaceable. And I'd like to, to ask uh, any of you how you see the connection uh, within art and technology. Because uh, the art is, we take it as uh, something that is uh, produced in a human being. Art takes the whole body. It takes a total dynamic interaction within ourselves. It puts your values, your feeling, whether you express this peace building through your movement, through your uh, music. I mean, it takes the overall human being. Now, in the technology field, that I feel these two fields will be wonderful to be together so that we are, have a very creative production. I mean, basically on technology, uh, you are in front of, of something in front of an apparatus, in front of using mainly your brains into this. But you don't move, you don't create the scene, you are not part of that scene. We have worked in IDP camps, we have worked with uh, traffic children, we have worked in all these difficult situations of war, and sometimes there is no need of, of a speech. It's just yourself. You use all kinds, I brought here puppetry, we use all kinds of elements that the art produce. So how do you see the future in which all these fantastic things that I have learned a lot today, we could put at the service of peace building, I mean, starting from the very beginning, from young children to really envision what are the values of a peaceful world and what can we do dreaming on the future to put art and technology together? Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, in theory, that's a question that Aaron could, Andrew, but I could answer, but I will let Andrew talk because I also know that the UNICEF PBEA program has a lot of cultural work with children in education, so maybe he could respond with that or something else, but both of you can respond. So I'll just respond briefly because I, I don't have all the answers for what the future could look like. Um, but for me, fundamentally, both the arts and technology are serving the, the need to amplify voices of, of the silent majority of people around the world, where the very few who use violence dominate how our communities interact, and we desperately need these tools of, of the arts um, and technology to, to give voice to these people who, who really, I think, without question, make up the majority of, of their societies. Um. When you were asking the question related to sort of creative learning opportunities and, and peace building, the first thing that I thought of was very practical. Uh, when I was in Liberia, uh, someone came from the World Bank to help Liberia develop a private sector development strategy. Their focus was where's the value chain? Let's look at these, uh, you know, essentially extractive industries. So you have a lot of um, palm oil plantations. Uh, rubber plantations, but basically they're looking at, okay, we have an extractive industry, we want to give people jobs working for these international companies on these plantations. And that was the focus. And we don't want to look at youth because we don't like to categorize. We just want to look. So that was the approach that they were taking, uh, sort of, you know, made friends with the guy and kind of talked him into thinking about a different approach. Uh, which was, okay, first of all, you need to engage youth in Liberia. This is a huge issue, and if you're going to look at employment, look at youth. Do youth want jobs in, on plantations, uh, serving people? You know, like, the, the quality of those jobs are very, eh, like, who wants that job, right? So, 
I said, have you thought about creative learning opportunities? Have you, have you checked out the music culture? Have you, looked, have you listened to music? Have you looked at what you know, people are, like artists are doing here? And a lot of it was sort of music, you know? And a lot, of, a lot of talented musicians there, but no one's really looking at building value chains around the music industry and about, around artists there or, or uh, tourism and the kinds of jobs that that would generate and the value chains where that would generate jobs for organizing festivals or you know, all these things. And he, it was just amazing to see his entire mindset change and he started engaging with the ministries on this and working with the musicians and identifying where the problems or the bottlenecks were for the, but this is all very technical level stuff, but it, it takes an entire shift in mentality of, yes, we can encourage creative learning and creative expression, and, but we have to take some very, I mean, we gotta look at value chains, all this stuff that's like, not as amazing to artists to think about, but in order to, to really facilitate that artistic expression and generating jobs and livelihoods around that and really developing a culture around that, you need to start thinking about these other things that you wouldn't normally think of, so. Um, you are raising a, a very, I think you might be onto something, I'll be just blunt. Um, uh, I, I, I don't want to sound, um, I may be privileged be, because I'm Greek. Uh, and the way you frame the question, uh, uh, techni in Greek is art. So when you're speaking about the technology of techni, I, that's why I said you might be onto something here that has evaded most of us, if not all of us. Uh, w first things first, when you say the art of technology, it's very much, we all understand what you're talking about, how technology can become art and what is behind technology that makes it, exactly, there you go. It's not as, first instance evident when you say what is the technology of art but i think if you if we do push the limits of how can art be technological what is what are the what, what are the mechanisms behind art that in relation to peace building i think may uncover what we call the meta power of art how art can then to what extent does it have the, the necessary mechanisms to change identities. So essentially we are moving from the, if you are, if you are talking about technology of art, I think uh, it makes sense in my brain right now, but that might be because of jet lag. Uh, it, essentially you are asking, you are making the first step to uncovering the mechanisms of art and conflict transformation. How can art utilize its own power to change the power of peace building and transform it? identities, issues, dynamics, actors, uh, behaviors, perceptions, and so on. So thank you very much for that. I want to pick up on the theme of do no harm um, and stitch it across to the practitioner side. Um, I can speak from experience in peace building. We're very rarely in a position to say that we have done no harm. Um, it is something that I think we aspire to, that we build into our designs. But we're very rarely able to put our hands on our heart and say, yeah, we did no harm here. That's partially because do no harm is about unintended consequences and unintended impacts, just as much as it is about the intended impact. Um, our use of technological uh, tools has very much increased our ability to assess the impacts we know we want to have. Um, what do you guys think that we can do to assess the impacts we didn't realize we would have, positive or negative? So our program is uh, known to outsiders as Learning for Peace. And our donors have been very, um, very much emphasized learning on, on unintended consequences. Uh, they want us to learn from our mistakes. Uh, a big part of this uh, has been the development of case studies. So we, we try to identify where we had unintended consequences and where we we had strong results and really dig into to that unintended consequence and really research on it and create a case study that communicates that story because they want to know the story. And so I think, you know, being a good program manager and paying attention to those things and then investigating them, finding out what the causes, like what, what's going on there and then trying to improve your program, redesign your program, shift your programming or say, hey, that really worked. We weren't expecting that. What is it about that that matters? And then applying that you know, uh, across different contexts if it's relevant. Maybe it's not relevant, but, but yeah, really we try and, we have a very sharp focus on unintended consequences and then documenting that. 
Anyone else? As a practitioner, I'm, I'm not a practitioner, so <laughs> therefore I can't really say much. I, I can only build upon this guilt that he says we, we, we obviously can't find cases that we do no harm, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it the microphone to you on that. It's a difficult question. Um, it's, 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 as I was saying earlier, for us, um, we're just scratching the surface of, of understanding even the positive impacts of, of what we're doing through social media and through, through publishing music videos and you know, creating these online spaces. Um, so this is definitely an important question to look, to look towards in the future, and I appreciate the, the question. Um, I think I have to leave it there. Um, Jordi? Yes. No, thank you. It's more than a question. It's kind of echoing a little bit uh, your question about uh, art uh, and technology, and, and, and actually reference to Nanjun Paik, who's from South uh, Korea and kind of known as uh, you know the the uh, the first person who built uh, video art and technology and art. He had this uh, this thought that uh, you know the challenges of art and technology is not how to use the next gadget, but how to humanize technology. And I think that's what actually what, what we are doing. It's kind of like you, uh, using uh, technology through art and humanizing technology. Um, so it's basically just the, the importance of that what we're doing is basically finding ways of, of, of using technology as a way of humanizing it through art and through art expression. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, do any of the panelists want to respond? We still have a few more minutes for questions if uh, anyone has. Yes. Yeah, I, I think Socrates Tradis, uh, the Hands of Famagusta project. I think, I mean, one question would be how many of us here are generating projects in the countries where they come from and they're not actually going there <laughs> and just going back to the research fatigue that you were talking before. Why am I saying that? Because I think there are two kind of um, exteriorities that we see here. One is ourselves as kind of uh, activists or authors of, of these um, kind of uh, activities. And the other one is to see technology outside of the social becoming. And I think because from since this morning we've been really uh, seeing some really beautiful kind of... Uh, innovations in technological products. However, what we actually were not talking about is this huge dichotomy that exists and it's actually latent within our discussion between the social and the technological. And I think by the time we begin to incorporate technology into the social, and I think there's a lot of debate on that, and that's where the, the actors' networks can come in. I think that may be a way to interiorize our actions and realize, first of all, but that technology is not neutral at all. It's a kind of, it has hidden programs and they're absolutely political themselves. So the do no harm, which I think was a great question, of course, it, it comes as guilt because when we start, we think that we're neutral and we just want to do something good. But I think if we realize that this kind of, instead of talking about peace, is talking about kind of conflict transvaluation, so whenever we go and we go out, there's still going to be conflict there because that's how <laughs> politics is generated. And I think that may uh, begin to give us different ideas of how we are part of this technology. And, and that's how, because I'm not a technological person either, and because at the same time, being from Cyprus, we're emerged inside the conflict which we're trying to address, and that may, it would be really interesting if this kind of technology as we define it was produced within those environments and not outside those environments. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Um, could you, would you mind phrasing it as just a, a summary question for the panel? 
I think it's more like a comment. If you want to add on that, I don't want to have it as a question. I, I think, if you don't mind, I think it's very interesting, yes. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about, the do no harm. Um, in, in the sense that, again, I, I, I've tried to touch upon that when in, in my talk when I talked about liberal peace building, where we have this kind of uh, hypocrisy slash arrogance. We know better, we are here to solve this, we are going to help you. Uh, and that's, things become murkier, things become dirtier even, when you encounter this kind of resistance from the populations that they say, we would like you to help us as well, but not in the way that you are trying to make it, because we know that this is not going to work. And then there's more resistance from the internationals. I know I'm putting it in, I'm oversimplifying it to a certain extent, that the bad internationals versus the good locals or vice versa. It's definitely not like that. A more nuanced approach, uh, approach is needed. But I think the whole do no harm, to go back to the earlier comment, uh, the, the whole do no harm and the guilt and the exteriority is not so much from arrogance, it's not shown so much from hypocrisy, it's more by pressure that we are putting on ourselves. And here I think the practitioners might be more um, uh, appropriate to, to give you an answer or to uh, counter comment. We certainly, I certainly see that in academia. We have that kind of, in peace building, whenever we're talking about peace, we have this uh, underlying assumption that we are writing something about peace, we're making suggestions about better peace building, uh, improved peace praxis and so on. But we tend to forget peace is not going to happen in two or five or 10 or 15 years. Peace might take generations to happen. Uh, and going back to your talk, when you said this is a very comfortable, a very civilized conflict, we don't kill each other anymore. I think that was the key part of your comments, the anymore. And then you said, and we talk to each other. So there's a conflict, but at the very same time, it, there isn't any conflict. But how long did that take? And at the same time, the conflict is there, but it's not as we have it. And this is what, again, this is my own personal inward search when I'm writing about peace or when I'm reading about peace. To what extent can we rush things? And perhaps this should be a question about technologies. To what extent are we still doing the same thing, if not worse, with ICTs? Are we trying to rush things even more? Is that going to work or is that going to make things even worse? And I'm going to leave it that as a comment. It's hard for me to pinpoint exactly how to enter this. I think um, this question of, of doing no harm and, and making sure that these <coughs> initiatives are, um, well, having, having this, the desired impact, I think the, the reality is, in a way, in, in a deep way, we're waging conflict of our own against the status quo. And, I think with that comes an inherent uh, risk that, that are, like, for at least for me, that my participants are, are taking on themselves. And um, I think the reality is that for, for these sustainable, for these long-term changes to, to take effect, we need to have the you know, foundation um, built on, on the grassroots, on the, on the, the ground level. And, and in the process of, of setting that foundation, certainly you know, pushback will come from, from the others in the community. And certainly um, people can be harmed in this process, but I think it's, uh, it's crucial to, to do what we can, even if, um, you know, and obviously to try to minimize those harms. Okay, we're almost out of time. I'm just going to give our panelists time to have one wrap-up concluding sentence, and then was there one final question? Okay, yes, one last question in the back. Thank you for your indulgence. It's actually not a question, it's just a remark. I wanted to address the point about do no harm because I think it's crucially important. And I know we've talked a lot about it, and I just had an additional thought. Um, I think it's a critical question that you raise, and it's something that we collectively maybe don't pay as much attention to as we ought to. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is um, I think that there's a significant amount of investment in understanding um, 
how our programs are working and what we're trying to achieve and whether we've achieved what we've said we wanted to. But I do think in the peace building field, I see what I perceive to be a comparative lack of investment um, in understanding the system in which it interacts. And we do punctual research on that system. In other words, understanding the conflict dynamics, uh, particularly at the very local level. I think we, we do a lot of, we tend to invest at the macro level in understanding doing a conflict analysis of a country writ large or a conflict writ large, but we don't really focus on what are those local level dynamics. And for those of us who are working at the community level, that's crucial to understanding do no harm. You have to understand the system in which you're working before you can understand how your programs interact with that system. Um, and so the way that we're trying to address that in UNICEF and Burundi, sorry, I'm Erin in UNICEF Burundi. Um, the way that we're trying to tackle that is with our quarterly conflict scans that we do in partnership with Search for Common Ground. Um, and there's a huge component of that in the focus group discussion that does just focus on this question of do no harm. So not only are we trying to take the pulse of what's going on at that local level, but then explicitly asking um, groups that don't necessarily even involve beneficiaries at all how they perceive those programs interacting with those, with those conflict dynamics. Not to suggest that we've solved the problem, but just that we very much recognize it's there and are making an explicit effort to address it. Um, and, and that that also links up with the, the national level baseline that Drew referred to earlier um, that was done by Harvard Humanitarian Initiative for us. Thanks. Thank you, Erin. Um, I'm really glad I let you speak because you promoted my organization. <laughs> Completely coincidental. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up. This whole discussion has reminded me of um, something a scientist once said, I can't remember who it was, but he said at a certain point when technology gets to a certain level of advancement, it becomes indistinguishable from magic. And for me, that's what I've been seeing today is a lot of these new opportunities seem magical. But that's to me, and I think if I went to, for example, my home village in Cameroon and said, hey guys, I'm a magician, I'm a witch, I would receive a very different reaction from what I, you know, the reaction here. So it reminds us that all of this has to be context driven. As Erin said, you know, today we're not here talking about the importance of technology. As Yana said, we're talking about how to do better peace building. And so all of these discussions need to be rooted in the context, in the people that we're trying to reach and support. And so on that note, I would like to thank our panelists, the organizers, the caterers, and all of you for sticking with us through to the end of the day. Thank you very much.